Good afternoon. My name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the president of the Center for Security Policy. I'm very pleased to also serve as the publisher of the Center for Security Policy Press. And we have with us the author of the newest edition to the rather remarkable series of publications that have been produced by CSP Press. Uh, it's entitled, Burn This Book. What Keith Ellison doesn't want you to know, a radical Marxist Islamist, his associations and agenda. The author is Trevor Loudon, who we have uh, the pleasure of having with us here today to engage in a live streamed conversation about Keith Ellison, about the insights that he has pulled together about his past and about his present and not least some thoughts about what may be in his future that ought to be of concern to all of us. And we're going to be going through this in some detail, and it is a pleasure to say that Trevor Loudon brings to this topic uh, a wealth of experience as a national security practitioner and expert, as a man who has been studying closely, specifically, the phenomenon of what he calls enemies within. That is to say, those who are here in our country or in his native New Zealand or elsewhere, who are seeking to achieve basically the same objectives as foreign enemies, namely the takedown of countries like ours, and doing so through various means, uh, including penetration, uh, infiltration, subversion, and the like. He is the author of a book entitled The Enemies Within, Communists, Marxists, excuse me, Communist Socialists and Progressives in the United States Congress. He made a movie of the, uh, the same name, Enemies Within, and more recently, in addition to this new book, Burn This Book, he has published um, or produced, I should say, a series of what I think of as micro documentaries about a number of people like Keith Ellison, who are currently serving in the United States House of Representatives and or the United States Senate. So these are um, times where I think the expertise of Trevor Loudon and his various contributions could not be more needed or more timely. And I'm pleased, once again, to say welcome. To my friend, Trevor Loudon. Great to be here, Frank. Welcome to the Center for Security Policy. Thank you, sir. So good to have you. That's great to be here. So, before we get into the book, I thought we might just set the stage a little bit, Trevor, by talking about who is Keith Ellison. Well, Keith Ellison is is the epitome of what you and I term the red green axis. Now. Any, anybody who's served in the military knows that they swear an oath to the Constitution to guard against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Right. And Keith Allison is the epitome of the domestic enemy. Mm. He is heavily involved in the, in the red side of things, the communist movement, the Maoist movement, Maoists, Trotskyists, pro-Soviet communists, Alinskyites, Alinskyites Democratic Socialists, Antifa, mm. his entire life the whole span of, of, of the left, the red side. But obviously we know he has worked with most aspects of the green side as well. He's worked very closely with the Nation of Islam. And uh, Mr. Farah Khan um, was just down in Cuba, by the way, celebrating the life of Fidel Castro. He has worked with Sunni Islam Muslim Brotherhood fronts like Care and Isna and Ikna. And he's um, very also tied to Iranian type of fronts, mm. and also to the to the Turkish mm. pro-Turkish organisations. And Turkey is com increasingly becoming the leader of the Islamic world mm. right now, the Islamist world. Mm -hmm. So Keith Allison couldn't pass an FBI background check to drive a school bus. Yeah. He couldn't be a realtor in Florida. But he served in high-powered congressional committees. Mm -hmm. He's been he's one of the top people in the Democratic National Committee, the deputy chair of that. And now he's running for the um, attorney generalship of Minnesota. Right. Well, let, let's yeah. unpack what you've just said, uh, because there's so much there to address. 
he is a member of the United States House of Representatives at the moment, though he's not running for re-election, as you say. He's uh, standing for election to the role of the Attorney General of Minnesota, the top law enforcement officer of that state. Um, where did this begin? Uh, at what point did we start seeing these very troubling associations between Keith Ellison and the, the hard left, for example? Well, he's, he started out in, in a conservative Catholic family, but he went to university in Michigan, mm. and immediately he became connected to the left. He, he became connected to the left before he became connected to Islam, mm -hmm. actually. And he um, was connected to several radical groups at, 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 when he was at university in Michigan. He then became uh, active in a Sunni Muslim mosque in Michigan, and you wonder to what degree his conversion was political, mm. because it was quite fashionable for young black radicals of the time to adopt Islam as a, as a sort of native religion of, of, you know, of Africa. Mm. And so he became very active in the left at, in Michigan, but when he moved to Minnesota um, to further his studies at law school, he became very heavily involved in Maoist groups mm. who were tied to the Freedom Road Socialist Organization and it was very, very close also to the Trotskyist pro-Cuban Socialist Workers' Party. Well, let's just, again, help the public that may not really have much familiarity with Maoist groups uh, or the, the hard left uh, communists any longer. I mean, there's certainly a, an uptick in interest in and indeed identification with socialists. But... Just remind us, Trevor, what what are the hallmarks of the communists, the the agenda, if you will, that would make somebody who is embracing them uh, really so problematic from a public policy point of view? Well, that's right. So why shouldn't communists be in, in Congress? Why shouldn't communists serve on the Intelligence Committee or the Homeland Security Committee? Well, if you're a communist, if you believe in the the Marxist ideal of, of revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, and they still do, the Communist Party USA still advocates the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, mm. as do the pro-Chinese Maoist groups, as do the Trotskyist groups. You believe in overthrowing the basic foundations of this country. You believe in replacing the free market, free enterprise system that has produced so much wealth mm. and prosperity in this country with a top-down, collectivist, centrally controlled um, system that basically concentrates all wealth in a very few hands. Mm. So you believe which, in which is all the more ironic because, or, yeah, of course, yeah. the uh, the capitalists are reputed to be yeah. concentrating the power and the wealth uh, in their small hands, exactly. and and everybody else is deprived of uh, the redistribution of that wealth that the state would provide under this uh, communist or socialist system. And, and I think that's a very important point to emphasize that people say, well, communism has always failed. It's always been a disaster. Why would people promote it? No, it hasn't failed. It's been fantastically successful because communism isn't about redistributing the wealth or giving everybody a fair share of society. The proletariat but paradise, the it's, proletariat it's, paradise. it's not? It's never been about that. It's always been about using the lumpen proletariat, mm. the poor and the uneducated, to bring to power the, the, the well-educated elite. Mm. You know, the Castros in Cuba are not poor. Mm -hmm. the, the leader of North Korea is not poor. Mm. Vladimir Putin may, is a, a multi-billionaire. The leaders Some say of the, China the wealthiest man on the planet. The as wealthiest a matter of fact. man on the planet. So, but many of these actually come from wealth, as you say. That, that, it's, that, that, it's, that, it's not just that they're not proletarians; yeah. they are uh, they're people who came from the the bourgeoisie, as they say. Absolutely. And Keith Ellison came. His father was a, a very well-to-do lawyer. Mm -hmm. You'll find most leftist leaders came from very well-to-do families. Chairman Mao came from a very mm -hmm. well-to to do family. The Castros came from very well a very well to do family. Che Guevara was was a very wealthy young man. Mm. You know, so you're, young you're, you're basically saying that that people of wealth, in case after case after case as you've mentioned, have figured out that they can use the communist doctrine and techniques 
um, to and whether you call it communist or whether you call it social democrat or socialist or progressive whatever it is the application of essentially power manipulation and control measures in order to dominate the yes. the masses not for their betterment but for the uh, the betterment of the elite absolutely if you read lenin if you read alinsky these were educated well off people who just loved power mm -hmm. and they were ruthless in its in, in, in gaining it. See Lenin would always say it's not the it's not the gaining of power that counts, it's the keeping mm -hmm. of power. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the reason someone like Allison is problematic, if you believe in liberty and freedom, if you believe in in, in freedom of speech, if you believe in prosperity, if you want your kids to grow up rich and happy and free, you have to oppose everything Keith Ellison stands for mm. because he wants your kids to grow up enslaved and impoverished. Yeah. And he will use every lever of the government to achieve that. Well, let, let's talk about one other piece of this, which, as you say, is the green piece, uh, green for the, the Islamic uh, color, of course. Um, in addition to enslaved and impoverished, it seems he wishes you to be Sharia compliant or at least submissive to it. Um, talk about his conversion to Islam as best you've been able to document it, uh, notably during his years with uh, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Yeah, well, if you'd listen to Keith Ellison, he's never been involved with Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. He's never been anything more than peripherally involved with the Nation of Islam. That is a complete lie. He was involved, when he moved to Minnesota, he was very quickly became involved with the local affiliates of Nation of Islam. He was one of the leadership group mm. uh, uh, in, in Minneapolis. He was involved for at least seven or eight years, right up till he was elected in Congress, and the people helped him to get him elected. So he was intimately part of the Farrakhan organization. Now Farrakhan is um, a sort of variant form of Islam, the Nation of Islam. People have called it a cult, for a, a example. Cult. It, is, yeah. it is a cult. Look, the two leaders, the two editors of The Final Call, the Nation of Islam's newspaper in the 60s, were both Communist Party members. Mm. The Communists have worked with the, this cult of Islam for a long time to, to steer black Americans into an anti-American world view. Right. So, so he was involved heavily with the Nation of Islam. When it became inconvenient for his political career, he ditched them and became a a conventional Sunni, Sunni, Sunni Muslim. But immediately he was picked up by Kerr and Isna and Ikna, who are all fronts for the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the father of Hamas mm -hmm. and Al-Qaeda. So he was basically working with the, the, the terrorist wing of the Islamic movement mm -hmm. in the United States. He was the part of the legal front for the terrorist wing. And he is no, we ought to be clear about right this. Through. The... the there will be people who will cavil about calling the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists. I personally believe they are. They are certainly jihadists and yeah. very much imbued with this idea that their duty, as defined by Allah, is to impose Sharia through whatever means are available. If it's through force, if it's through terror, if it's through financial support, if it's through demographic changes, uh, the hydra, as they call it, uh, migration, or specifically civilization jihad exactly. of the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, particular uh, specialty. Talk yeah. us through that, and, and how does a guy like Keith Ellison feature in the civilization jihad, Trevor Ludd? Well, civilization jihad is, is the molding and changing of a culture to, to adapt or assimilate or be taken over by Sharia compliant Islam. Mm -hmm. And so what we mean by Sharia compliant Islam is that Sharia is a central law of Islam. It is dictated by Allah. And it means that every aspect of your life must be compliant with Allah's law. Mm -hmm. That is your marital affairs, your business affairs, your political life. It is top down and it's totalitarian. And anybody who really is a compliant Muslim must follow this law. 
It's like you cannot be a Christian without following the Decalogue. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a Christian without following the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, this is the central doctrine of Islam. You cannot be a good Christian. You cannot be a good That's Christian. That's for sure. You, 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 exactly. and, and the authorities of the faith say you can't be a faithful Muslim without following Sharia, Sharia law. And, and, and not only submitting to it yourself, but imposing it on others. And let, yeah. let's just stipulate, because of course we often hear this criticism, we are not suggesting that every Muslim, certainly every Muslim in America, embraces Sharia, wants to live under it. In fact, my own view of this is a great many of them came here to get away from yeah, it absolutely. in their own countries because it's pretty awful. But what we are talking about and what I think is sort of the, the continuity between Ellison's association with Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and his involvement with the Muslim Brotherhood is they're all Sharia supremacists. Yes. They have their sort of nuances and peculiarities, perhaps, but basically it's the same program. So let's turn to what it means, in your estimation, based on your research, Trevor, in your your book about the enemies within, your documentary film about the enemies within, and, and of course, most immediately, this book entitled Burn This Book. What is it? likely to mean that a man with these sorts of associations, this sort of pedigree, if you will, this agenda, uh, leftist, Islamist, uh, red-green, whatever you want to call it, is an influential, indeed senior, member of the United States House of Representatives at the moment. Yeah. Well, he's also a leader of the Democratic National Committee, and he that also too. helped to set up the Muslim Democratic National Council, mm -hmm. which was an alliance between people like Nihad Awad of Kerr right. and Nancy Pelosi and Senator Chris Murphy and others to cement the sort of red-green axis at mm -hmm. the highest levels mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party. So what it means and let's is, not forget the Pres Progressive Caucus, which he chairs. Well, the Progressive as Caucus, well which House. is... 77 strong right now was set up by Bernie Sanders and Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party USA and is the channel for progressive policies into the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and they have succeeded in pretty much taking it over now. Right. And we're likely to see more of them uh, in that caucus uh, well, after this election. Well, I would say you could have over 90 to 100 if, if things don't go, if things wow. go as the Democrats hope they go. So, so, so what, what does that mean? In well, terms of what policy that, in the Congress. Well, what that means And our is, security. Yeah, what that means is America is based on the Constitution. It's based on the separation of powers, of, of Supreme Court, um, you know, executive, legislature, judiciary, all of these things that preserve the freedoms of this country. There are two main enemies of the American system. One is international socialism or communism, which wants to, which understands that it cannot rule the world while America is free and independent. The other is Islamism, um, Sharia-driven Sharia Islamism, which also understands a, in Amer an independent America as the number one stumbling block to their designs. Mm -hmm. So you have an, an, an unholy alliance right now between the red and the green, both wanting to bring America to its knees mm -hmm. so they can have their way establish their, their caliphate in the Middle East, they can have their globalist world superstate, they can do all of these things. And maybe they will fight each other at some point. In the end, almost like, inevitably. Yeah, like two they, mafia they, they clans. Don't, they don't agree on no, they don't the agree. end state that's to be But what sought. they do agree in is that we are the num number, that America is the number one stumbling block to right. their goals. So they'll fight later. But right now they want to bring us down. So anybody who believes in these two systems Will be or either to, one of them, for that matter. Or either but one, especially or, or both, both of them. as Keith Ellison does. <laughs> yeah. He will be working to undermine the U.S. Constitution. He'll be working to undermine the U.S. economy. He'll be working to increase, um, uh, to lower border security so that m many more illegals can come across the border, terrorists, terrorists can come across the border, more refugees from from non-American loving countries can come into this country. Mm -hmm. So he will be working to undermine what we would call constitutional Christian America mm -hmm. um, at any opportunity. Judeo-Christian America. Judeo-Christian America yeah. at, at any and, and when you say he will, 
I mean, well, he basically what you're talking about is the present state, what yeah. he has been doing now for whatever it's been, four or five terms in Congress, right? Yeah, he, he, look, he, is, he has been working on several committees to, to basically spread his doctrines, to, to promote his people. If you look at his own staff, he has several members of Democratic Socialists of America who served with him. He has several care interns who have mm -hmm. served with him. So he is promoting, the, bringing these people into the Congress mm -hmm. where they may gather information, where they may help to write legislation, where they may help to influence public policy. Yeah, at the minimum. There's and, an influence and, and, operation and, and there. At the absolute minimum. And, and credentialing them for future For, for future uh, roles. runs for Congress or future... You know, there may be aides to senators and they may, they may mm -hmm. serve on the Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. at some point in the future. And again, so, these are people who have associations themselves yeah. with organizations tied to the Muslim Brotherhood and its Sharia supremacist anti-constitutional agenda. Yeah. Which brings me, you mentioned running for Congress. As the number two leader of the Democratic National Committee, it's my understanding, Trevor, that the sort of ambition Keith Ellison has expressed is to double the number of Muslim representatives in the Congress every election cycle. Now, it's a relatively small number at the moment, basically himself and Andre Carson. Yeah. But uh, in that role as a leader of the Democratic Party, in that role as a man who has his hands on the machinery of the one of the two major political organizations in the United States, um, presumably he's in a very formidable position to act on that ambition. Yes. And let me just again say, the problem is not that these candidates may be Muslim. They're entitled to run for office like anybody else. If they're qualified and they get the votes, they, uh, they can prevail. The issue is if they are Sharia supremacist Muslims, that that becomes a different kind of yeah. problem and one that I think does warrant this public policy debate. And I, I should have said at the outset, the Center for Security Policy is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization. And our interest in these matters is not the political uh, arena or the role that Keith Ellison might play in it from a elective standpoint. It's a public policy issue. And we need to be clear, as you've made clear, Trevor Loudon, both in what you've said to us today and in your new book about Keith Ellison's radical Marxist and Islamist associations and agenda, that uh, there's a lot of public policy yeah. questions to be asked about him and, and what he's up to. But do talk well, a little yeah. bit about the DNC business. If well, you well I'll, I'll just go back a little tiny bit. See, see, when I came to this country from New Zealand, I had to swear a declaration that I'd never been involved in any communist or totalitarian group that sought to overthrow the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if I had been a communist or a fascist or anything like that, I would not be admitted. Now that's if not, you acknowledge if I acknowledge that the truth, but but that's not racist. That is just pure national good national security policy. Right. So if you're a, a, a member of Congress who swears an oath on the on the Bible or the Quran to uphold the U.S. Constitution, and you believe in either socialism or or communism or Sharia. You are lying. You have to be lying because you can About something. You have to be lying about <laughs> yeah. something. Right. So you, 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 you're starting your job telling a lie mm. right from the start. So you're automatically a security risk. Mm -hmm. Automatically. Now, over 90 Muslims stood for, for public office across America this year, many for Congress. Well, two have been elected, one from Minnesota to replace Keith Ellison. She is a... a, a, a well, they haven't a, technically gotten the job no, yet. No, but, but they're both they're in very safe seats. In a so slam dunk primary. situation. Yeah. Uh, slam. Well, one of them doesn't even have an opponent. Yeah. Um, so there are likely to be at least three Muslims in Congress after the election. One, Keith Ellison, uh, 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 Andre Carson from Indiana, who we, we well know his history, who serves on the Intelligence Committee. 
and and we and and the, the woman from um, who's a Somali refugee, a woman from Minnesota, but also Rashid, who is very Sorry. heavily involved with CARE, the mm -hmm. Council on American Islamic Relations. She's very a radical. Hamas front group. Uh, Hamas front group. Right. And the other one is Rashida Tlaib from Michigan, in the 13th district. Now she is a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. So she is a Marxist. She has a long history in Michigan with several Marxist groups, but she's also a long history with CARE. Mm -hmm. So she's a member of a Hamas front, she's active with a Hamas front group and a Marxist group, which has ties to former East German communists, has ties to the Cubans and other radicals. Mm -hmm. So two people from the red-green axis are going to be in your Congress in the next cycle. Right. So they're going to be on committees. They're going to be, might be on the Defense Committee or the Judiciary Committee. Yeah. You know, when, when we say that uh, CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, is a Hamas front group, uh, we actually have at the Center for Security Policy Press an important book that documents this based on a transcript that was introduced into evidence in the Holy Land yep. Foundation trial, the largest terrorism financing trial in U.S. history, that lays out the fruits of a surveillance operation back in the day when the FBI did this yes. sort of thing on the organizational meeting of what has come to be called the Council on American Islamic Relations. And why it's so riveting is you had in that meeting representatives of Hamas, and representatives of a precursor to CARE, uh, the Islamic uh, Association for Palestine, that were recorded plotting to put together a new front organization for Hamas to raise money and to engage in what I think would accurately be described as political warfare. So when Trevor Loudon talks about Keith Ellison's associations with CARE, uh, with uh, Rashida Tlaib's and, and others, this is why we are saying with confidence the roots of CARE and its ongoing operations are deeply tied to Sharia supremacism in general and specifically to the Muslim Brotherhood's Palestinian arm Hamas. So Trevor, let me just turn quickly to uh, one other piece of this, uh, and that is as you've mentioned, Keith Ellison is standing for election to become the next attorney general of the state of Minnesota. Uh, without getting into the, the politics of this or endorsing any candidate, needless to say, I, I just would like you to explore with us, knowing what you do about Ellison and his background, and knowing, of course, what functions the attorney general of a state plays, what kinds of issues might arise from a national security, perhaps, from a public safety point of view, from certainly a public policy point of view in Minnesota? Well, I think the, the key way I look at it is this. See, see, Minnesota, I think, was deliberately targeted for, for mass Islamic refugee resettlement because Minnesota was always very much one of the most left-wing states in the Union. You know, you had the communist Red Finns who came to the the, the Iron Range back in the 1900s. You had the, in fact, the, you've written an occasional paper on the yes, yes. radical roots of uh, Minnesota, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, it's a very deeply uh, red state in the in the in the communist sense because the farmer Democratic Farmer Labor Party was actually set up partially by the Communist Party, mm. and that's now the local affiliate affiliate of the Democratic Party. So that there's a there's a whole very left deeply left wing culture there. And they very much welcomed the, the, the influx of immigrants from Somalia, etc., because they understood these people would be useful as a voting base and allies mm -hmm. uh, against conservatism, the Constitution, Christianity, etc. Now, so, is, am I correct that Keith Ellison's first run for Congress was fueled in no small measure by tapping into those Somali uh, absolutely, refugee absolutely. populations in and, Minnesota? And that's still going on. They, and they have been tapped They've been right growing. now to try and, yeah. and they're growing continuously. But so, so anybody who now stands up says, says, look, say, say some conservative groups stood up say, we are very worried about the influx of Sharia-compliant Muslims into our state. 
We think this is a, a security problem. It can cause this potential terrorism. Mm -hmm. This is putting public safety at risk. Keith Allison, if he was Attorney General, would then go after those groups mm -hmm. and shut them down on the grounds of these are these groups are promoting hate speech. Mm -hmm. They are promoting anti is they are Islamophobes. Mm -hmm. So he is the sheriff mm -hmm. of town. He is the sheriff of the state. Were he to be that top were, law were enforcement he to, officer, were he to get that job. Yeah. So he decides who gets prosecuted mm -hmm. and who doesn't. Right. Who gets defended and who doesn't. Yeah. So he can be very very partisan mm -hmm. in that regard. And partisan in the political sense, but yeah. partisan in terms of this public policy sense. Yeah. And, and you've said something that I want to just come back to. Uh, when we hear about this idea of, uh, of silencing hate groups, uh, explain the title of this the book. The title of the book, yeah, that, that's a good uh, For starting yeah. points, go ahead. Well, the title of the book is Burn This Book. And well, what does that evoke? That evokes the, the Nazi era where books were burned that, that stood in opposition to, the, to Hitler's um, plans. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we look at that era as, as a horrific thing. Well, Keith Allison, only in the last few months, publicly basically challenged uh, Bezos, the head of... Demanded, demanded was the word he used. Or demanded, the, Jeff Bezos, the head of, um, of Amazon, to, to ban any books on his inventory that had been in any way criticized by the Southern Poverty Law mm -hmm. Center. Or the which, groups or authors or were or the considered authors to be hate a, groups or hate people. Hate groups, people. and this is a right. designation that a private institution run by radical leftists mm -hmm. with a long history of supporting CARE and other Islamist front groups designates people as haters, people who stand up against mm -hmm. the Islamization or the Marxization of their areas right. are now haters. Yeah. So well, let, let me just put in a special uh, word here. Of course, our organization has been so identified Absolutely. by uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. I can feel the hate dripping when uh, I well, come into the room. Uh, let the record show there is no hate here. But what you do have is authoritative challenging of the political agenda of the SPLC and others in this red-green axis for which they are really now, I think, a mechanism for queuing in the whole objective of these groups, which is yeah. political warfare against our country. If we are silenced, if, if people here at the Center for Security Policy or our friends and colleagues like Trevor Loudon are silenced, the predictable consequence is that people like you won't know what danger is now afoot in our land from these yeah. enemies within. So I don't think it's an accident. We uh, talked about it on our radio yeah. show shortly before this letter from Keith Ellison to Jeff Bezos uh, surfaced that we were publishing this book uh, that was going to document his background. And uh, as you say, not only has he put Bezos on notice by this demand that he mustn't publish any book like, well, this one, but if there are any in his inventory, he yeah. needs to destroy them. He's Hence, got, burn this book. Yeah, look, look he, he, is, he is a book burner. He is someone who does not believe in the free exchange of ideas mm -hmm. or freedom of speech. And he may, could become the chief law enforcement officer of a major American state. Mm -hmm. Well, think the, of the implications of that. Now, if you go back to this thing of, of you know, being called hate speech, before World War II, there was a man called Winston Churchill who regularly stood up in the British Parliament warning of the dangers of Nazi Germany, that they were terrible people, that they could cause huge problems, they were persecuting people, they were evil. And there was a whole bunch of people in Britain who wanted to shut him down. Mm -hmm. And if that had hate speech laws at that time, Winston Churchill could have been shut down. Indeed. And what would have that have done to World War II? We may have lost World War II as a consequence. Almost certainly. So, so almost as you say, almost certainly. So, anybody who warns against national security threats, internal threats, could be shut down. Mm -hmm. Now, so therefore, those internal security threats will have no opposition, and a, in a, a short order of time, they will become the dominant force in society. Right. So if we value and, and freedom, we have to understand, it, we have to guard it. Yeah, if you're looking at these uh, candidates in this uh, current cycle of elections, you yeah. see a lot of people who, um, uh, like Keith Ellison, have uh, 
pattern or associations or have expressed their sympathy for the agenda of these uh, these enemies within. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very alarming. And I, I did want to just ask you quickly about something, and you touched on it at the very outset, but to come back to it, I, I think most Americans would find incredible, Trevor Loudon, that these people are not being vetted there's a lot of talk about vetting at the moment. Yeah, security uh, clearances, vetting. Clearances and, and, you know, the deep state and, and, and Kavanaugh's uh, nomination and so on. Um, and yet you say that the basic processes that are in place to protect our children being driven around on school buses, for example, do not apply to people who hold access to uh, positions that give them access to some of the most sensitive secrets in the land, including Andre Carson on the Intelligence Committee, for Absolutely. example. Look, look, How could this be? Well, because it was long ago decided that we would not subject congressmen to security background checks because the people are supposed to vet the congressman and the media is supposed to help you do that. But if the media is not doing that job, that opens up a very big loophole, which I'm sure the North Koreans are well aware of. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Muslim Brotherhood is well aware of. I'm sure the communists are well aware yeah. of. Chinese, uh, Russians. The Chinese, the Russians. So I, I say there's at least 100 members of the US Congress right now, and at least 20 to 25, probably closer to 25 members of the US Senate. Mm. That's at nearly a quarter of each body are so enmeshed in Muslim Brotherhood front groups neo-communist groups or with foreign powers like China or Cuba or Iran, they couldn't pass a basic F FBI background check to drive a school bus. Yeah. But they are subject to no checks whatsoever, not even to serve on the Intelligence Committee, yeah. the Homeland Security Committee, the Armed Services Committee. There are several, several pro-communists on the Armed Services mm -hmm. Committee. There are several on the Homeland Security Committee. And there's at least four problematic people, in my opinion, on the Intelligence Committee. This is in the House of Representatives. In the House of Rep and that yeah. doesn't count the Senate. Yeah. But, you know, um, so, so... And when you say that, let me, let me just make sure we're qualifying this. You're saying that on the basis of the sorts of things. You, you told the story about your admission into our country, for yeah. example. Yeah. The sorts of things that in the past, when we at least paid lip service yeah. to the idea of counterintelligence and the vetting of people given access to sensitive information. This would not have flown. It is now, and unfortunately their numbers are so large, Trevor Loudon, that it seems unlikely there's going to be any kind of correction to it. So in closing, let me just ask you, uh, knowing what you know, having documented it as you have in this book, uh, in your previous book, uh, Enemies Within, your film, and, and not least, I do want to commend to you all the, what I call micro documentaries that Trevor has been churning out now, one or two a week for several weeks, um, to inform us about the information that you have and that is actually available if people simply have the wit to uh, obtain it. But tell us what you would recommend, first, presumably, to the voters, and second, to the, the authorities within our government who have the duty, as you say, the sworn duty, to protect our Constitution, I swore this oath myself, yeah. against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, I think um, I have a website called KeyWiki, K-E-Y-W-I-K-I. -E -I. So go to that and look up your congressional candidates, because I've got several hundred biographies in there mm. of, of congressional candidates who have ties to Muslim Brotherhood, communist groups, etc. Just check out your own candidates. Mm. I would also recommend The Enemies Within, um, our film, which details a whole bunch of these people. You can get that at enemieswithinmovie.com. And, and, but I would say, if I was President Trump or I was a member of the executive branch, I would say something like this. We are going to clamp down on this country on, on enemies, internal enemies. We're going we're gonna to give amnesty, not to illegal immigrants. 
we're going to give six months amnesty to enemy agents operating in this country. If you come forward right now mm -hmm. and you expose your networks, tell us who you're working for, who you're working with, what you've penetrated, we will put you in the witness protection program. Mm. If you don't come forward in six months, we're going to go after you and you'll be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Mm. You imagine the consternation that would cause in CARES ranks, Indeed. the Chinese networks operating in this country, the, 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 the Iranian networks operating here. There are thousands of enemy agents on, in this country right now, many of them with close contact with congressmen and senators mm. on a daily basis. Yeah. We need, to, we need to disrupt that chain of subversion. These are two eminently sensible ideas. One, do your due diligence, whatever your political persuasion and you know, policy preference. Know who you are voting for. And a great resource is keywiki.com. Dot org. Excuse me, dot org. Uh, another is to encourage I think at the end of the day, we get the government we deserve, I think. We need to encourage those responsible for our internal security, um, whether it's against threats from the left or from the Islamists or in the persons of people like uh, Keith Ellison, you know, folks who pull those two strands together. We need to make sure that the government of the United States is doing its due diligence to try to protect us against these enemies yeah. within. And I think a thing that you've often suggested is to get President Trump to honor his promise to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a, as a terrorist sponsoring organization. Amen. That would make it so much harder for your congressman to affiliate with these people and make it so much easier for organizations like the FBI to go after their networks in this country. Yeah, another great suggestion. Press your elected officials um, in the executive branch and or in the Congress to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. We're at the end of our time. Trevor Loudon, let me just again commend you on this terrific book, Burn This Book. Uh, we hope you'll read it before read it burning first. it, mind Please you. Read it first. And by the way, uh, you can order it at Amazon. Interestingly enough, you can also get it as a downloadable PDF for free at securefreedom.org. I want to thank you for your time today, Trevor, and for the extraordinary work you do. You're, you're not only, as I say, uh, prolific in print and in film, but you also are a fabulous public speaker. And uh, you've gotten a taste of what he has to say. If you're interested in finding out how you can bring Trevor to your community to teach your colleagues, neighbors, family members, what have you, how can they most easily get a hold of you? Well, just go to my daily blog, trevorloudon.com. Uh, Loudon is L-O-U-D-O-N, trevorloudon.com. And you, there's, you can email me from there. And, and I do public speaking all over the United it States. Does. I'm just going away for a month's tour in the next few days. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you for kicking it off with us here. Thank you for being with us for this live streamed event at the Center for Security Policy. Uh, we will be doing more in the days ahead. Please check our resource-rich website, securefreedom.org, to stay abreast of what we're up to and what you need to know about for your securing of freedom. Thank you for joining us. We wanted to add a postscript to our live streamed broadcast because a topic that we had failed to note warrants attention. And that is that one other problem that has come to light in recent days is Keith Ellison's personal history of domestic abuse. Uh, there are several women, uh, I believe two, that he has been romantically involved with who have come forward uh, with documentation of acts of violence and psychological abuse that he's engaged in. And Trevor, I just wonder, as you think about this individual's personal affinity for and indeed espousal of Sharia, might there be a connection here between how he treats women and that belief system? Well, I think um, you'd have to say the line is probably more blurred. As someone who believes in Sharia law, Sharia law treats women as second-class citizens at the very at minimum. Best, yeah. and, and, and 
not just approve, not just allows beating of wives, but actually specifies how you can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of instrument you may use to to beat your wife into and submission, where. Or, yeah. or where you may hit her, yeah. etc. So, and this isn't simply a matter, as I understand it, of it being permissible to do that. It's actually expected of you in order to keep the woman in her place. Yeah, is that it's, right? it's, it's an obligation as as the head of the household mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, you, you do not spare the rod. You, you, yeah. you use physical discipline where appropriate to keep your wife or wives in line. Yeah. And so you've got someone, like Keith Allison, who has a background in Sharia law with a history of spousal abuse. Well, to him, maybe it's not anything bad. It's just what is expected of him as a good Muslim. Mm. So any woman voter, any female voter in Minnesota, you'd have to be thinking... Is such a person appropriate to be the chief law enforcement officer mm. in your state? Mm. You know, what's, what, what kind of message does that send wow. all down the chain to every husband out there, to every Muslim husband or, or other husbands indeed, mm. that the, the, the top law enforcement officer has a history of, of abusing his wife yeah. and, and may be sanctified by, by, the, by the religious law that he adheres to. This is an important public policy issue, needless to say, and I appreciate you drilling down on it a little bit with us, Trevor Loudon. Thank you again to all of you for listening to the author of this important new book, Burn This Book. Thanks for joining us.